My name is uh, Harriet O'Neill, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all, um, your virtual audience, um, and also our live audience, which comprises our award holders here at the BSR and our staff. I should introduce myself, which, I'm, as I said um, to the people joining us, I'm currently a blue square um, with the BSR logo, but I'm actually Harriet O'Neill and the Assistant Director for Humanities and Social Sciences here at the BSR. And for those of you who don't know us or are new to us, we hold lectures every Wednesday evening in Rome, and tonight is our second attempt to host a hybrid event. So it's very exciting and you're part of a, an experiment for us. Do sign up to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter to hear about our future talks. But the most important thing is to introduce Dr. Jan Mackelson, who is our lecturer tonight, and we're so grateful that he can join us. He is a senior lecturer in early modern history at Cardiff University, but for the academic year 2020 to 21, he's the Humboldt Research Fellow in Dresden in Germany, where he assures me it is uh, definitely autumn. Prior to joining Cardiff University in 2016, Jan held a number of lecturing and research posts at the University of Oxford, from where he obtained his DPhil. Now, many of you may know Jan uh, as author of Martin de Del Rio, Demonology and Scholarship in the Counter-Reformation, which was published in 2015, and also as editor of The Science of Demons, Early Modern Authors Facing Witchcraft and the Devil, which was published in 2020. And the former was listed as one of History's Today's uh, books of 2015, so I urge you to read it. But vitally, it brought together his interest in early modern Catholicism, history of scholarship, and witchcraft studies. And I had the pleasure to get to know Jan um, when he spent three months at the BSR in 2019. And I was always very intrigued about um, his days in the archives and what he was discovering. So I was delighted that he agreed to give this lecture and tell us about those discoveries. Um, before I hand over to Jan, though, I should explain that I'm going to mute myself and hand over to Jan, and I'll come back at the end of the lecture, um, always as a blue square. Um, the virtual audience can ask questions um, through our microphone, but the, uh, no, through the Q&A function, sorry, <laughs> um, and the live audience will um, have the pleasure of, a, of a, a roving microphone. You might not get a chance to get through all your questions, but um, we'll do our best. And also, I'm sure Jan um, would uh, be willing to be contacted with you can see after that. So um, tonight, the lecture is entitled Forcing the Papacy's Hand, the Unlikely but Inevitable Beatification of the Masters of Horkham, 1572 to 1675. So over to you, Jan. I'll mute myself and say thank you so much um, for joining us. It's a great pleasure. And I'm going <laughs> to give you a virtual round of applause. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Harriet, for um, both the very kind introduction and for the, the invitation. Um, I'm really delighted to um, be in Rome virtually. Um, I'm so sorry not to be able to join in on the Prosecco and the salty crisps uh, later on, but I'm, I, have very, I have very fond memories of, of, of attending many of these lectures, and it's a great honor to be invited to give one up today, even even if it's not quite in the flash. Um, I wanted to sort of start this paper with a caveat to saying that what I'm presenting to you today is the next research project rather than the current one. I'm currently trying to finish a book on something entirely different. Um, but this is something that I've been working on and off on for a number of years now. So I do think I have enough material to, um, to give you an overview of what I've been working on. And I also wanted to begin this paper with uh, a quick word of thanks to two other people, in addition to Harriet and uh, the BSR community. I wanted to thank my friend Claire Copeland, whose book on the canonization of Maria Magdalena de Pazzi um, has been an inspiration um, to me for this project. Um, and I wanted to thank the local historian just the book fell on the ground. <laughs> the local historian, um, uh, Roy Taper, who was very kind um, to show me around the principal sites relating to the martyrs in the towns of Horkham and Briel, which is where the martyrs died. Um, uh, his work on the iconography of the martyrs is, um, is really, really fascinating. Okay, so 
without uh, much further ado, on oh, there we go. Now I need to get my slides to work. On um, the 15th of July, 1570, the Huguenot Corsair Jacques de Sor seized the merchant vessel Santiago off the coast of La Palma, the, the most northwesterly island uh, of the Canaries. Little is known of Sor's maritime activities, except that his piracy may have been revenge for a Spanish massacre of a small colony of French Protestants on the coast of Florida. Learning of the colonists' fate, according to one 19th century account, Soar, I quote, immediately set sail in a state of indignation, went out to sea and killed every Spaniard and Portuguese he came across, end of quote. Not surprisingly then, upon learning that the Santiago was carrying not only cargo, but also 40 Portuguese Jesuit missionaries on their way to Brazil, Soar took immediate action. Kill them, kill these papistical dogs, kill them. They seek to spread depraved dogmas in Brazil. Some of the Jesuits were slain first, but dead or alive, all were thrown overboard where they found a watery grave. And you can see one engraving um, here. This group of Jesuit martyrs, often called the Martyrs of Brazil, that I never ever got close to Brazil, uh, offers a very useful comparison for my main object of study. A group of 19 Dutch priests who were killed almost to the day two years later, on the 9th of July 1572, by another group of pirates, commonly called the Sea Beggars, or the Aquatici Hieratici, Aquatic Heretics, as they commonly appear in my Latin sources, which always makes me think of the Olympic Games. So on the 1st of uh, April 1572, the sea beggars had captured a small port of, uh, of, of Den Bril, also called Bril or Brielle in English. Many other towns in the province of Holland fell into their hands in short order. The town of Gorkum, near Rotterdam, from which most of the 19 martyrs came, surrendered with barely a fight on the 26th of June. These martyrs were a motley crew, only brought together in death. Eleven of them were Franciscans, but they also included two Norbertines, a Dominican and an Augustinian friar, as well as secular priests. Their deaths were just the most egregious example of a wave of radical Protestant violence against Catholic priests as royal power in the Low Countries collapsed. Other examples are the so-called martyrs of Gorka, uh, martyrs of Alkmaar, a group of six Franciscans who were executed on the 25th of June, and the martyrs of Rumunt, a group of 12 Carthusians, a perfect apostolic dozen, on the 23rd of July. Within the context of the Dutch revolt, there was then sadly nothing remarkable about the fate of the so-called martyrs of Horkum, except perhaps the size of the group involved. And if we zoom out and return to our original comparison with the martyrs of Brazil, it is instantly noticeable how much more superior this other group, group's assets were. If anyone were to guess during the late 16th or early 17th century, which of these two groups, the groups of Brazil, the martyrs of Brazil or the martyrs of Gorkum, would be beatified or canonized first, or indeed at all, they would have put all their money on the Jesuit martyrs. After all, the Mediterranean bias in saint making was and is well known. More than 80% of counter-reformation saints came from Italy and the Iberian Peninsula. Yet the martyrs of Brazil are also noteworthy because their cult was enveloped by a whole coterie of other saints who, as an additional bonus, further tied them to Rome. Their leader, Ignacio de Azevedo, had a personal audience with Pope Pius V prior to their departure. And Pius had given Azevedo a copy of one of Rome's most famous religious objects, um, the famous icon of the Virgin and Child in the Santa Maria Maggiore, known as the Salus Populi Romani, the protectors of the Roman people. 
and whatever they tried, the pirates could not prize the Virgin out of Azevedo's dead hands. When in 1571, Pius, the sole counter-reformation pope to be canonized himself, extolled the many blessings brought to the church by the Society of Jesus in his papal bull, Dum in the Fessai, he included the glorious martyrdom of Azevedo and his companions. Further proof of the martyr sanctity was provided by Saint Teresa of Avila, perhaps the most famous of the Counter-Reformation saints, who, according to some hagiographies at least, saw the souls of the martyrs ascend to heaven at the very moment of death. And in addition, um, the, the cult was supported by Francis Borgia, the equally saintly superior general of the Society of Jesus, who prohibited the saying of masses for the souls of the dead Jesuits, saying that they did not need them. And, and although we may roll our eyes at the following, even the place where the Jesuit martyrs died was deemed hugely symbolic. The Canary Islands are also known as the Fortunate Isles, and as I already mentioned, Ignacio de Acevedo and his companions attained the palm of martyrdom off the coast of La Palma. By contrast, the martyrs of Horkham hailed from a place that few non-Dutch speakers and certainly no Italians could ever hope to pronounce successfully, Horkham. And yet, as you will by now have realized, it was not the group of 40 um, Jesuits, but the 19 Netherlandish priests whose beatification was celebrated in a richly decorated St. Peter's on the 24th of November, 1675. Engravings based on the paintings produced for that event um, by the Rome-based artist Johann Zienels still survive, and they are an assault on the senses in every way. One shows the martyrdom of the 19 priests depicted in gruesome detail. Um, note how the soldiers are about to cut off noses and ears on the foreground. Um, and this painting was meant to have been, uh, the painting version of this was meant to have been on the outside of St. Peter's uh, uh, during the event. Uh, another shows um, the, the martyr's proverbial apotheosis. Um, a very crowded staircase to heaven that makes me wonder what a version featuring, you know, 40 Jesuits, like twice as many would have looked like. Um, and yet Ignacio de Azevedo and his companions would have to patiently wait for nearly two centuries longer before they could join their Dutch brethren. They were not beatified until 1854. Um, and indeed, their canonization is still pending, uh, which means that um, the documents pertaining to their cause um, are still have not been transferred into the archives, but they remain in situ in the office of the postulator general of the Society of Jesus, in a room in the Jesuit Curia bedecked with images of Jesuit saints. Um, and in this very room, decisions about Jesuit causes are still being made today. Now, if at this stage you feel bad and think that you sh really should have heard about the martyrs of Horkham before today, then let me first of all reassure you that um, a great many of you will actually have seen the martyrs on visits to Rome without realizing. A vast painting commissioned um, for their canonization in 1867 is placed prominently in the Vatican Museums at the entrance to the Raphael Rooms, not far from the Sistine Chapel. And this is a holiday pick with me and my parents. My parents are watching at the moment, Ahoy Pama. Uh, so I just wanted to do a quick shout out to, to them. Uh, I do have a, actually a better version of the image, uh, the painting as well. Uh, um, and secondly, uh, it might also be reassuring to know that even Netherlandish historians have given remarkably little attention to the martyrs of Horkham. There's been a substantial revival of historical interest in early modern Netherlandish Catholicism 
over the past decade or so, following the work of Judith Bowman and Gerd Janssen and their many students. And yet these works pay scant attention to the martyrs, whose study remains in the hands of mostly local historians. This is in spite of the fact that the martyrs' canonization proceedings include fascinating first-hand testimony that sheds light on precisely the topics that have interested historians of the Dutch Revolt so much. The relationships between the sizable Catholic minority and the Protestant majority in, in the Republic, which was effectively mission territory. Um, uh, the relationship between um, the Catholic laity and the clergy um, in, this, in, in this Republic, and perhaps especially the way the Dutch Catholics experienced and remembered the revolt that confined them to the margins of Dutch society. So I'm, I'm hoping to give some sideway glances at some of these aspects in this talk, um, but as a comparison, with the martyrs of Brazil already suggests, for the purposes of this lecture, I am not interested in studying the martyrs of Horkham in a Netherlandish context, but rather I would like to place them at the very least on a European stage, if not a global one. I propose to study them comparatively because they were ultimately in competition with other cults and because only a comparative approach can adequately explain their success. Indeed, Dutch historians have not realized just how remarkable the martyrs of Corkum are within the wider history of Roman Catholicism. I chose as an opening comparison Ignacio de Azevedo and his companions because the proximity in their dates and their manner of death as well as the apparent strength of their cause make, makes it a particularly fitting comparison. Yet the fact is that I could have picked virtually any Catholic killed at, by Protestant hands in the early modern period. The beatification of the martyrs of Horkum in 1675 marked the first time that the papacy beatified any Catholic killed by a Protestant. They remained the only ones until 1729, when they were, when they were joined by Fidelis of Sigmarion, a Capuchin friar who had been killed in 1622 during the opening stages of the Thirty Years' War. Blessed Fidelis would jump the queue in 1746 when he was made a saint. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the martyrs of Horkham were not canonized until 1867. There were a handful of other martyrs too, killed before the Reformation, for instance, or outside of Europe. And one medieval martyr, John of Nepomuk, was also canonized in 1729. Yet among the many, many Catholics killed by Protestants, faithful Fidelis remained, remained the Horkheimer's only companion well into the 19th century. So the question then is, what makes the martyrs of Horkham unique? Why did they succeed when other causes failed? So the answer to that question can tell us a great deal about the role that beliefs about martyrdom played, not just in the context of the Dutch Revolt, but in early modern Catholicism across the board. In his almost canonical article, How to Be a Counter-Reformation Saint, first published in 1984, the year of my birth, Peter Burke used the 55 saints canonized between 1588 and 1767 as, I quote, witnesses to the age in which they were canonized. And Burke famously distinguished the main routes to sanctity, founders of religious orders, missionaries, and bishops. Martyrs, as you will have guessed, were not among those main routes, a fact that Burke himself labeled surprising. And Burke added with considerable understatement that I quote, other that other martyrs were unofficially regarded as saints seems likely. 
that martyrs were in fact key to early modern Catholic devotional life actually needs no argument. Any visitor to Rome can admire the 16th century frescoes of Santo Stefano Rotondo, for instance, whose scenes of ancient martyrdom were intended to edify the students of the nearby Collegium Germanicum. And if you like what you see here uh, and have some time spare on a Tuesday or Thursday morning between 10 and, uh, and 12, you could visit the church of Santi Neri a Achilleo. Um, uh, um, it's the other way around, I think, Santi Achilleo e Neri. Um, uh, no, Santi Neri e Achilleo, restored by the Cardinal and church historian Cesare Baronio for some even stronger scenes of martyrdom. I'll uh, quickly put these aside. <laughs> so, so while these portrayals of martyrdom in Rome itself were partly inspired by the discovery of the Roman catacombs, um, late 16th century Catholics across Western Europe commemorated and celebrated those who died at the hands of the Protestants, um, as of course the other side did in the other direction. Perhaps the most famous account of these is the Theatrum Crudelitatum Hereticorum Nostri Temporis, the theatre of the cruelty of the heretics of our own time of 1587 by the Anglo-Dutch antiquary Richard Verstegen, which includes, um, among other uh, engravings, um, scenes from both the Martyrs of Brazil and the Martyrs of Horkham. And while they, as you've seen, each received their own engraving, others were grouped together. So the image here shows Thomas More and John Fisher sharing a gruesome stage on the foreground, which they never did in life. They were executed uh, a month or so apart. While Margaret Poole, Countess of Salisbury, Salisbury is um, dispatched in the background. Um, so that is uh, there. Uh, so there is, in other words, a gigantic puzzle here. Why were there martyrs everywhere except among the saints? Why were the martyrs of Horkham the exception to the rule? So if we understand why they were beatified, then we will understand why so many others have failed, and that in turn will provide us with a much richer understanding of early modern Catholic sanctity than Burke's crude 36-year-old taxonomy. And this brings me to the second reason why the Martyrs of Horkham matter, and to the, to, to the title that I chose for this lecture. Appreciation of their uniqueness will, I argue, also shed light on precisely uh, where agent, agency and authority in the Catholic Church lied. In, uh, in particular, I will argue that actions of a number of figures in the Low Countries, often unintentionally, created a situation that forced the papacy, uh, that forced the papacy's hand. Decisions made in the Low Countries ultimately left the papacy with no real alternative other than to permit the martyrs beatification. So naturally, in order to achieve beatification or canonization, two ingredients are absolutely essential. So the first is a considerable sum of money because the, the papacy was not and is not a charity shop and the cost of beatification and canonization were high. So for instance, in 1674, um, in a letter to the abbot of the wealthy premonasterian pre abbey of Park outside of Leuven, the postulator, that is the person who is responsible for shepherding a cast through the process in Rome, estimated that they'd spent um, 300,000 Italian scudi so far. Uh, uh, and in this very letter, he asked for more money uh, in order to make the actual ceremony possible. So if money is one ingredient that the martyrs of Horkham had, um, the other was the support of a monarchy or religious order. And the cause was firmly supported by the observant branch of the Franciscan order from which 11 of the 19 martyrs came. So here you see, for instance, the Chiesa Nuova built in 1615 in Assisi on the supposed site of St. Francis's birthplace. And it includes this really prominent and frankly, completely over the top fresco of 
the many fires minor martyred in um, Flanders. I mean, these scenes of martyrdom are even more gruesome than what the martyrs of Horkham actually um, uh, received. So having met these two important uh, conditions, there were two obstacles that the martyrs of Horkham needed to overcome, and which they did, as I already suggested, inadvertently. The first was the actual official definition of martyrdom, which was considerably more burdensome than we might think today. What makes a martyr a martyr? American evangelicals who claim that Christians continue to be martyred in their hundreds of thousands arrive at that number simply by, by counting as martyrs any Christian who dies in conflict across the world, especially in Africa. Yet the vast majority of these did not die for their faith. They did not die because they were Christians. And as both Catholics and Protestants in the early modern um, world well knew, uh, following St. Augustine's famous dictum, it was not the death, but the cause that made the martyr. Um, and that statement requires considerable unpacking. So this 1623 pamphlet on the martyrs of Horkham transformed Augustine's insight into five criteria for martyrdom. And the first of these is that you have to be killed, I quote, out of hatred of Christ or the Christian religion, or any aspect of the true faith. And while as the other criteria make clear, the victim needs to willingly accept their fate, it is this first criterion that is most troublesome, because it is not just the willingness of the victim, but the intent of the killer that ultimately makes the martyr. And this provokes serious headaches for many potential causes. So the 12 Carthusians in Rumuns, for instance, that I mentioned earlier in passing, died while their monastery was being pillaged. Did they die for their faith or for the greed of the invading soldiers? A similar sort of difficulty, I would suggest, envelops most of the Catholic martyrs in England who died on the scaffold as political traitors. But to appreciate the extent to which this really affected the progress of any particular cause, we should turn back to our original comparator, the martyrs of Brazil. In his analysis of the documents submitted in favor of the martyrs' beatification, the promoter of the faith, the, 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 the official better known uh, today as the devil's advocate, argued that the martyrs of Brazil were not true martyrs. It was entirely possible that Jacques de Sor, the Huguenot pirate, did not hate Catholics. What if, the promoter suggested, he only hated Jesuits? After all, all the other Catholics on board were unharmed and Sor did not kill any other members of the clergy during his expeditions across the Atlantic. So as one would imagine, this suggestion went down as a lead balloon in Jesuit headquarters. And the procurator of the cause replied simply that heretics hated all Catholics, but especially the Jesuits, because of their vow of special obedience to the Pope. And sadly, this strategy did not work. Of the 21 consultors of the Rota that examined the cause, only nine were willing to support the necessary finding of martyrdom. So it should be stressed, I think, that even the cardinals of the Congregation of Rights, um, whose task it was to scrutinize the canonization proceedings and these reports filed by the consultors, um, that even these cardinals took great interest in martyrdom. On the 11th of November, 1641, for instance, at the outset of the British civil wars, they took note of the killing of two Catholic priests, one William Ward and um, an Edward Barlow, in London, I quote, pro fide catholica, and they resolved to write to nearby Catholic jurisdictions to obtain, I quote, more information, more information about their death and cause of death. 
a similar decision followed news of the death of two further English priests on the 22nd of March, 1642. Simon Ditchfield, in his work on the failed canonization of Pope Gregory X, in an article that was actually published in the Proceedings of the British School, already drew our attention to the overly juridical nature of canonization proceedings from the 1630s onwards. This overly le legal mindset and the looming question how anything could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt explains a great deal about 17th century saint making. Uh, so what, so who, you might wonder, is responsible um, for uh, the martyrs of Corkum overcoming this first hurdle, proving that they were indeed real martyrs rather than um, possibly not in the case of the martyrs of Brazil. Um, um, uh, by the way, this is uh, uh, a slide of, uh, from a comic book um, that was published in 2007 by the Bishopric of Rotterdam to uh, bring the Martyrs of Horkham to a young audience. I don't think comic books in 2007 are the way to go, but uh, it seems like a fitting background for what follows next. Um, well, so who um, is responsible for the Martyrs of Horkham? Well, the answer is no less a figure than their evil opponent, Guillaume de la Marc, Count of Lume, the person who was actually held responsible for their death. What saved the martyrs of Horkham was the fact that four of the original group, including one young Franciscan, were in fact persuaded to recant their faith and denounce the papacy. And crucially, these four were let go. And the relevant scene here is the one on the bottom right. Um, Conversely, the hatred of the sea beggars towards Catholicism was displayed by the posthumous cutting off of noses, ears, and penises, which the soldiers used to decorate their hats. So later chroniclers lamented the lack of faith of the four apostates, especially because it deprived um, the Franciscans of that perfect apostolic number of 12. Um, but their release helped to prove that the remaining 19 died out of hatred of Catholicism as opposed to anything else. Or so we might think. Even in these circumstances, um, when the martyrdom of the Horkomers came up for discussion with Pope Alexander VII in March 1666, not all of the consultors were completely convinced, but even most of the holdouts agreed that the cause could at least proceed to the next stage, which is the discussion of the miracles. Um, and with the idea being that discussion of miracles would bring further light, shed further light on the validity of the martyrdom as well. So after the consultors left the room, the cardinals and the Pope continued their discussion. And the, the, the records reveal just how difficult proving martyrdom could be. The Pope and the Cardinals agreed that while there was sufficient proof that the martyrs had been imprisoned on account of their faith, the cause of their murder remained difficult. I quote, because the Lord of Lume did not only order it in hatred of the faith, but truly also out of an anger that he had conceived because the Prince of Orange, that is Lamarck's boss, had written a letter ordering the release of the heretics. Steeped in wine and suddenly very angry, he had ordered the priest to be hanged, and therefore it is possible to ascribe the proximate cause of death to the foresaid anger. So this passage shows how the papacy, if it wanted to, could move the definition of martyrdom completely out of reach. Um, I mean, I guess the Pope likes its, you know, Catholic slayers to be single-minded in their hatred of Catholics and, you know, of, you know, not drinking any alcohol in the process. Um, but, but crucially, uh, in our case, uh, the papacy did not really want to move the definition of martyrdom out of reach. Alexander VII permitted the cause to continue to the next stage, the discussion of the miracles, and when the paperwork for that was completed in 1674, Alexander's approval was taken as a proper sign-off on the martyrdom. Um, so, and as a quick aside, 
as we are on the subject of miracles, rather than being grateful for Lamarck's almost perfect hatred of Catholicism, the martyrs allegedly procured his death. So one of the miracles is ascribed to them early on, and which was even among the 12 scrutinized by Rome, was Lamarck's death supposedly after being bitten by a rabbit dog. Um, I don't know if that is the rabbit dog in the, the image. Um, but, um, but apparently ancient saints uh, had also, ancient martyrs had also similarly avenged their own deaths by um, having their, their killers be bitten by rabbit dogs. Um, um, and it was, was appropriate as one proposed epitaph has it that he who has lived as a dog died as a pig. Um, it, it was not, I, I reassure you, one of the two miracles that the papacy would ultimately approve. Um, um, but so far enough said about the martyrdom and how to prove martyrdom and how the, the martyrs of Horkham actually achieved it. Let me move on to obstacle number two, um, that the mark and which is the martyrs of Horkham had to overcome, namely the reforms to beatification and con canonization procedure implemented in stages by Pope Urban VIII between 1675, uh, between 1625 and 1642. And for this, we need to again zoom out and treat the martyrs comparatively to other cults. We need to understand um, the almost impossible obstacle course that the urban reforms represented before we can make sense of how the martyrs were able to navigate this particular obstacle. So ever since the papacy resumed saint making in 1588, after a hiatus of more than 60, uh, 60 years, it was confronted with the problem of what to do with modern saints. Sanctity was a lived experience in the early modern period and aspiring saints abounded, attracting and attracting many followers. A first crisis erupted in the opening decade of the 1600s, centering on the cults of Philip Neri and Ignatius of Loyola, the founders of the Oratorians and the Jesuits, respectively. Their sanctity had not, or rather not yet, officially been recognized by the Pope, but the Oratorians in particular acted already as if Neri was a saint. They handed out engravings of Neri with a halo. You can see one here. Um, in 1602, they, they moved Neri's remains into a new chapel in a ceremony that looked very much like uh, the ceremony translating relics. Um, and they commissioned a new altarpiece from a very young Peter Paul Rubens, which presented Neri too much as a saint. Or rather, as Ruth Noyes has shown in a remarkable study, they commissioned an altarpiece which showed Neri masquerading as Pope Gregory the Great. So, you know, that figure actually has Neri's features. Um, so the existence of unauthorized cults exposes a tension at the heart of early modern Catholic identity. On the one hand, these cults were the very lifeblood of the church, demonstrating every day that the age of miracles had not ceased in the way that the Protestants claimed. On the other, because these visions, miracles, divine graces happened to charismatic individuals and were championed by their followers, they also posed a challenge to the papacy and the idea of Catholicism as a visible and institutional church. As Miguel Goto has shown in his I Beati del Papa, Paul V took a much more relaxed attitude towards the problem of the cults of so-called Beati Moderni. Yet the issue came again to the fore in the mid to late 1620s during the papacy of Urban VIII. In 1625, the Inquisition issued two edicts that took aim at the existence of unauthorized cults. It denounced a series of abuses, namely images which showed private persons who had not been beatified or canonized with rays or halos in the way that Neri is on, this, on the PowerPoint. They um, denounced lives or accounts that dare to list of, of people's lives, that dare to list the miracles, revelations and other blessings that have been received from God following the intercession of these people. And they objected to the placement of votive objects or candles on um, the not yet canonized people's graves. 
So these edicts were codified in the papal Celestis Jerusalem Sives of the 5th of July 1634, which effectively set the rules for canonization until the papacy of John Paul II. Um, and among the most important rules that should concern us here are, um, there are three that I want to mention. The first is that um, the bill made beatification a requirement for canonization. Um, there had still been a lot of confusion about this and modern beatification is, is often seen as only properly beginning in 1601. And Carlo Borromeo in 1610 was the last person to proceed straight to canonization. Uh, the bill introduced a waiting period between a person's death and the start of their process of at least 50 years. And in line with the 1625 edicts, during this waiting period, there should be no, and I repeat, no public cult surrounding the candidate. The exception to this was if a cult was approved through a papal indulgence or through permission of the Congregation of Rites, or, and this is the main exception, if the cult has existed since time immemorial, which the bill defined as at least for more than a hundred years. So this created two strands, um, and this is important uh, to bear in mind. If a candidate for sainthood died before 1534, so a hundred years earlier, they should have a public cult in order to be canonized. Um, if they died after 1534, they should not, repeat, not have a cult. And this date of 1534 became a hard dividing line. Uh, a few years later, the congregation decided that it would not move. So the main historian of the Congregation of Rites during the early 17th century, the aptly named Giovanni Papa, is a great cheerleader for the urban reforms. In Papa's book, the congregation appears to be ripening as if it were a cheese. Some of the chapter headings actually read, maturity and ever more responsible discussions, and I quote, ever greater accentuated maturity. Yet the application of Urban's bull and the congregation's supposed, uh, or, I quote, organized, well-articulated and profound study of the causes resulted in practice in a veritable massacre of the innocents. A great many causes of modern saints were knocked out as a result, never to recover. And this included, for a time at least, our very own Martyrs of Horkham, who had been dead for more than 50 years, but who, as we shall see, were very much the subjects of a public cult. So to understand the profound and frankly bizarre impact that Urban's reforms had on the causes of aspiring saints, it is helpful to briefly look at a cause that until then had moved at, by Roman terms, um, lightning speed. In fact, an example is needed just to illustrate how mind-bendingly weird canonization proceedings became in the 17th century. So, when Robert Bellarmine passed away on the 17th of September, 1621, he was immediately the subject of a cult. On his death, his fellow Jesuits were excited by the size of the Roman crowds who wanted to see and touch the body, and frankly, they were relieved that the body remained intact. A month after his death, Marie de Medici, the Queen Mother, uh, wrote from France to ask for any sort of relic from Bellarmine, if possible, his rosary. And in June 1622, the royal confessor, Pierre Couton, wrote that he applied the relic, whatever it was sent, I'm not actually sure, um, to his teeth. Um, and it immediately relieved him from, I quote, an exceedingly great toothache. In Montepulciano, Bellamine's place of birth, the first informative trial was opened on the 20th of February 1622, that is less than six months after Bellamine had died. Other informative trials were held in Capua, where he was Archbishop, and in Naples, where he had been Jesuit Provincial. And in Rome, the famous theologians' cars moved at high speed as well. The Congregation of Rites opened the process on the 17th of July, 1623. In 1626, it issued the necessary remissorial letters for a full apostolic process. So you first have an informative process at the local level, ordered by the local bishop, and then um, that's sent to Rome, and then you send out remissorial letters. 
forceful apostolic papally sanctioned process. So this was held in Rome in 1627, contained reports of a number of miracles performed at Bellamine's grave and submitted to the auditors of the Rota for their examination. So the congregation's speed and enthusiasm um, are evident, um, and it may well have been increased by the fact that Bellamine had actually been a member of the Congregation of Rites, um, and therefore uh, the cardinals of the congregation um, were probably well aware that they had themselves a saint among, an aspiring saint among their midst, and Bellamine had been working on Philip Neri's cause on his deathbed. Yet even a cause as prominent as Bellamine's was halted by the urban reforms. The Jesuits were forced to remove the many votive objects accumulating on the Cardinal's grave after the 1625 edicts, and they temporarily stored them in the Jesus Guadaroba, the cloakroom, which in my imagination sort of like, you know, sort of like has all these votive objects next to a bunch of umbrellas. Um, and it petitioned or urban, um, the Jesuits petitioned Urban to be allowed to restore them, but that was denied. So the apostolic process then was not restarted until 1674, 50 years, just after 50 years uh, after his death, so when the interval period had passed. And at this point, the answers witnesses gave were very different from those of the 1620s. Most of the questions were trick questions. Were there any paintings of Bellamine in any Jesuit churches? Were there any wax candles in front of any images of him? Was he venerated at his grave? To all these questions, the answer was meant to be no. A cult was not permitted. When asked if he had a devotion towards Bellamine, the first witness, a 38-year-old man from Imola, replied, I cannot have a devotion for persons who have not been declared blessed or saints by the Holy Church. But nevertheless, as I have said, I esteem the servant of God, Cardinal Robert Bellamine, as a learned man who lived a good life. The second witness, a six-year-old man from Verona, declared that, um, I quote, I do not have any devotion for the said servant of God, Cardinal Bellamine, um, but I hold him in esteem as a great man who led a good life. So witnesses speaking in Bellamine's trial, the very purpose of which was to affect his beatification, or later canonization, testified that they knew no, no one who believed Bellamine to be a saint. Unfortunately, the judges do finally encounter a 76-year-old Jesuit who had met Bellamine as a novice and stubbornly insisted on calling him a saint. Um, and he also, in passing, revealed that all the votive objects that were once on Bellamine's grave were still hidden away in the Guadaroba, in the Jesu, ready to be brought back out when the, when the time was right. So you can almost sort of like hear the judges shout no across the page when, you know, sort of like, you know, when you're reading that. Um, so Bellamine would have to wait another two and a half centuries. Um, um, before he was canonized. And incidentally, Peter Burke notes the absence of theologians among the Counter-Reformation saints and much of the same obstacles that were particularly difficult for martyrs to overcome also apply to theologians, I would argue, and we can, can, can talk about that. But now you, you've seen what saint making urban style would look like um, in the face of such Kafkaesque bureaucracy, we could almost sort of say that successful saint-making became miraculous in and of itself. And surely that was partly the point of the urban reforms. Beatification and canonization not only stood at the crossroads between popular division, uh, popular devotion and official religion, but also between the local and the universal. And the papacy simply could not authenticate them all. In his amazing book on late medieval canonization, Andre Vosche remarks how confronted with a flood of cases, the papacy commissioned a great many local trials, but then never looked at any of the paperwork produced. It deflected responsibility and it was easier than just saying no. And Urban's reforms achieves much the same thing. 
the bureaucracy created was not a problem. It was the very point. It was the early modern saintly version of saying, I'm sorry, the computer says no. In the 1690s, when the cause of that other ultimately successful martyr, uh, Fidelis of Sigmarian, hit another roadblock, the Capuchin postulators of his cause penned the letter back to Germany, in which they denounced the consultants of the Rota as, I quote, the enemies of all canonizations. And I would argue, in a way, they were right. So now that we have the right measure of the seemingly unsurmountable mountain that was early modern canonization, the question we set ourselves becomes perhaps even more puzzling. How did the martyrs of Horkham succeed where Bellarmine, among many others, failed? And here I want to present a typology of successful saints that is perhaps more useful than Burke's. Um, there are, I think, three categories. Um, the most successful, the most obviously successful saints are the ones that the papacy itself explicitly exempted from the new rules as the rules allowed them to do so. Uh, François de Salle and Rose of Lima fall into this category, for instance. In the case of François de Salle, the 50 year, old, the 50 year rule was not even observed. Yet perhaps the most striking papal flouting of the rules involves the beatification of a martyr from a very different part of Europe, whose cause we have not yet mentioned because he was not killed by Protestants. Josef Kuncevich had been the Archbishop of the Ruthenian Catholic Church in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and he was killed in Vidbesk in present day Belarus by an angry mob in 1623. Konsevich clearly had not been dead for 50 years when he was beatified in 1643. In fact, he managed to die and be beatified during the reign of Urban VIII, the very Pope who had promulgated the seemingly strict regulations. And Konsevich's cause needs closer study, um, but it is clear that he received special treatment. When in 1629, the congregation discovered I quote, several defects in the paperwork it received from Poland, it petitioned the, the Pope to be allowed to, quote, heal them themselves on account of the long distance and the lack of, I quote, learned men in the region. And this was gladly granted. So I do not know what persuaded Urban a year before his death um, to grant um, the exemption to his own rules especially after he told you know, the advocates of many other causes that he would not make any uh, e exemptions because like, he was the one who came up with them. Um, uh, part of the answer must be the fact that um, Kunzevich was considered to be a martyr of the Union of Brest uh, of, 1515, of 1595, by which the Ruthenian Catholic Church entered into communion with Rome, which was seen as a massive diplomatic achievement by the papacy. Um, and that achievement was also um, realized by Clement VIII, Urban's uh, great patron. Um, so, 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 so there's more work uh, by me uh, or someone else to be done on that cause. So if uh, the first category is ones that, that are, are saints that are clearly exempted from the standard rules, a second category of successful saints and beati is, is represented by those whose causes were already exempted um, these were the causes of candidates who had passed away before 1534 and therefore, far from not being allowed to have a cult, were actually required to have one to demonstrate their sanctity. So the post-1644 beatification of the one remaining martyr that I have not yet mentioned falls into this category. Um, oh, I don't have a slide up for him. Pedro de Arbuez had been the inquisitor provincial of Aragon, when in 1485, he was assassinated in the cathedral of Zaragoza, allegedly by, I quote, wicked Jews. In terms of the regulations passed by Urban, Abu's cause is entirely straightforward. Candidates had to be dead for more than 50 years. He was dead. And if they had died um, um, before 1544, a devotional cult was needed to demonstrate sainthood and Abu as, uh, as an unofficial patron of the Spanish Inquisition was not lacking in devotees. 
So these are the two obvious sort of like categories that one could sort of identify looking at the list of both saints and beatified martyrs. The martyrs of Hokum do not fit these two categories. There is no evidence that their calls enjoyed any special favor from the papacy, and they died much too late to be uh, a normal exception. So to understand how they succeeded, we need to go back to the Netherlands again. Um, because, um, the, and, uh, and I promise this is not, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. This is not gonna like, I'll have another like five minutes. I'm just looking at the time. Um, so the cult of the martyrs did not properly get going until the 1610s, during, during a period known as the 12 year truce between the incipient Dutch Republic and Spain. In 1604, a Dutch translation of a new history of the martyrs sought to, uh, to quote, spread and declare the memory of the foreset martyrs, which otherwise, after the length of time, had almost completely darkened. Um, so indicating that, you know, the cult wasn't particularly well known by 1604. So this new history of the martyrs by the Douay theologian Willem Estius, a relative of one of the martyrs, helped to revive or perhaps even create the cult. You know, what made the cult of the martyrs of, of a large and public phenomenon was the arrival of their relics in the Catholic Southern Netherlands. In 1616, a secret mission was sent to identify the site of the martyr's death um, and burial in a mass grave and to recover their remains. Guided by a local mother and son, the conspir conspirators dug at night for three nights to retrieve as many of the relics as they could find. Um, it's the site is site E, uh, if you want to know where they were meant to be buried. And the arrival of these relics in the Catholic uh, Southern Netherlands is of special significance. The relics were publicly authenticated and translated. They were processed through most of the cities of the Spanish Netherlands and sparked healing miracles wherever they went. And these processions were vast public events, and they were often accompanied by publication of copies of Essius's book, um, often with an epistle addressed to the local magistrates. In Cambrai, for instance, the printer celebrated the relics of the martyrs recently recovered, snatched out of the hands of the heretics, a quote, honored in so many neighboring towns and now at last brought to Cambrai with the applause of everyone, the sweet smell of martyrdom now filling the air of the city. The process shows how many, um, organization process shows how many lay Catholics in the Southern Netherlands had never heard of the martyrs until the arrival of the relics, when the priests had told them of the miracles that the martyrs and their relics had worked elsewhere. For instance, on the 28th of June, 1629, Henry Dirks and his wife Anna Bakemans, citizens of Brussels, testified about the martyrs cures uh, how the martyrs cured their six-year-old son of an inguinal hernia that had been so severe that they often had to hold the boy up by his feet and with his head to the ground to keep his intestines inside his body. Henry testified that before the solemn procession of the, the relics, I quote, he heard the preacher report on the life and death of these martyrs and that while listening he was moved by a zeal of devotion towards them especially when he heard preach that in the city of Mons in Haino, during the procession of the martyr's relics, a man aged between 60 and 70 was, her was healed of a similar hernia. So the cure of Henry and Anna's son um, was actually one of the two cures that Rome would ultimately recognize as a genuine miracle. So the relics then formed the backbone of the martyr's cult in the Southern Netherlands, fostering devotion and creating miracles. And yet, as we now know, by 1644, the existence of a cult would become a major obstacle for any successful beatification. This is like a problem, not a good thing. So the other person then to save the martyrs of Hochum was the Archbishop of Mechlen, Matthias Hovius. It was Hovius who had authenticated the relics and turned their translation into a major event. Yet when another new batch of relics arrived in 1619, the Bishop of Ypres re rejected Hovius' authority to authenticate the bones, and the matter was referred to the Congregation of Rites in Rome. In their famous microhistory, A Bishop's Tale, Craig Harlan and Eddie Putt represent the judicial disputes as a bitter failure for Hovius. I quote, 
the inquest into the relics for, from Gorkum had gone nowhere. It would come to fruit only centuries later when the archbishop was less than dust. And Harlan's input study is amazing in many respects, but they appear to be ignorant of the beatification. And yet, I, and moreover, I would argue that far from having failed, Hovius triumphed, though he never knew it. The martyrs would not have become saints without him. Rome was overwhelmed by the material that had been sent, yet the bones had already processed through all the major towns of the southern Netherlands, and the congregation of rites was presented with a fait accompli. So in November 1621, the congregation decided that, I quote, the display of the relics that have already happened can be tolerated, but other proofs are needed to declare them martyrs, end of quote. In a letter to Jacob Bonin, Hovius' successor, the congregation wrote that the same devotion and veneration of the people towards the martyrs and the relics can be permitted to continue until such time as the Holy See determines and decrees otherwise. So this decision forms a crucial breach in Rome's defenses, one that ultimately forces the papacy to capitulate. The decree meant that the cult very happily continued to thrive, and the widespread dissemination of the relics probably prompted the cardinals to authorize the first apostolic process on the 1st of March 1625. But when they finally received the paperwork back a decade later, the landscape had fundamentally changed. And the cardinals spent three meetings debating as to whether they could even look at the documents they received in light of the Inquisition's decrees and Urban's bull. Um, so the issue of how these decrees squared with their own decree permitting the continued display of the relics was a vexing one for the cardinals. And the solution was readily apparent. The martyrs should be made an exception, a casus, except, a casus exemptus. In 1649, the congregation informed urban successor Innocent X about the, the I quote, censored display of the alleged relics of the 19 men who are called the martyrs of Horkum, following the decree of the Archbishop of Mechelen. And the, the Pope authorized them to treat the cause of the martyrs as an accepted cause, which followed the same rules as candidates who died before 1534. And this is literally you know, akin to falling through the looking glass. The, the, the main obstacle, the existence of a cult, suddenly is no longer a liability. It becomes you know, the best asset. So, in other words, the vast number of relics and Hovius actions have made the martyr's cult too big to fail. And by treating the cause as an, exam, as an, as an exception, the martyrs no longer needed to prove that they did not possess a cult. In fact, they needed one. Um, so from, from the Roman perspective, the beatification of the martyrs of Horkum regularized a bureaucratic abnormality. The existence of an unregulated cult, which they had accidentally permitted and which had become too big to ignore. So neither the papacy nor the congregation promoted the martyrs in, in, in a way that they had fast fact Kunsevich. They did not, I quote, heal the faulty paperwork that they received, but they showed striking patience when they told again and again that the Dutch needed, the Netherlands needed to uh, redo their homework. The first apostolic process conducted in the late 1620s and early 1630s can really only be described as a hot mess, offering amazing vignettes of Catholic life in both the Southern Netherlands and the Dutch Republic, ones that I'm happy to give examples of but I don't really have time for. Um, so the congregation ordered a second process that was held in the Episcopal Palace of the Bishop of Namur. There were no controversial hot takes by the laity on this occasion. Most of the witnesses were clergy themselves, all but one of them testified in Latin, and most backed up their testimony with references to Essius, even page numbers. So the martyrs of Horkum really were the exception that proves the rule. Their beatification succeeded against all odds because of accidental decisions made far from Rome. Yet any student of the cause cannot conclude that martyrdom did not matter to early modern Catholicism as a result, far from it. And there is much more to be said about the wider implications of their success for our understanding of sanctity and saint making in the early modern Catholic world. But time is clearly running out. So let me end by offering two very brief essential life lessons. The first is simply this, that if you have to be killed by pirates, 
make sure that it is on land. The watery grave of the martyrs of Brazil meant that there were no bones, no relics to sustain their cult. And secondly, it is always much better to ask first and, uh, and ask for forgiveness later, uh, as I now need to do for you know, speaking probably beyond my allotted time. Um, but who knows, um, act first, ask later, you might inadvertently contribute to someone else's canonization one day. Thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, I hope that was comprehens comprehensible by everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was really comprehensive. I think we should, we've got um, a group of people here, so we should give a round of applause and then... Um... <laughs>